about three years ago, I was interviewed by uh, The Economist, and we were talking about aggression. And I said that men are, on average, more aggressive than women, or they're more physically aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, so among children, for example, boys are more likely to kick, hit, bite, and steal. And that's not a bad operationalization of aggression, let's say. And then if you look within boys, a small proportion of the boys are that way at two. Most of them get socialized out of it, but those that don't are stably antisocial and criminal into the adolescence and adulthood. And then that burns out around 27, 28. That's the developmental trajectory of aggression. Doesn't look like it's learned. Okay, so... However, there's something else, so that's interesting enough. It's like, it's there at two. It's a rage circuit. It's an old, old biological circuit, and it gets controlled. And most aggressive kids are socialized by the time they're four. And if they're not, you can't socialize them after that. That's also very interesting and rather disheartening. But women, girls, however, they are more aggressive than males if you measure aggressive aggression differently. They use reputation destruction. So, well, we've seen what happens with social media. <laughs> Physical aggression doesn't translate to social media. But reputation destruction, that yeah. translates to social media unbelievably well. So maybe it's time to have a little chat about toxic femininity. <laughs> well, there, there we go. Uh, John, my, uh, I've got a little piece of paper here with some of the questions we were going to ask you. Uh, and the next one on my list is, why do people hate you? Uh, I think you've answered that. <laughs> why? So actually, why, why do you think? Why do you think? I mean, well, look, I was going to ask know, you this. But what would you point to? Well, let me ask you this, because I think this is an important part of it. Uh, Helen Lewis, who's interviewed you and who's who wrote a review of oh, your yeah. book. Who, she hates who, me. Yeah, she hates you. I've met Helen Lewis and uh, she's interviewed me and of all the things you might say about her, you wouldn't say that she was stupid and you no. wouldn't say that she was poorly educated, right? Mm, so I might say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was being generous. She took but advantage anyway. of the education that was offered to her, but yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. uh, but, so, so, but, so, but, but education let, is so corrupt that mastering sure. it makes you an expert at nonsense. Touche. Touche, I'll accept that. But let's just go with the she's intelligent point. So she should sure. be able to understand your arguments, and I'm sure she does. And yet I notice time after time where an intelligent person, even Kathy Newman, you wouldn't say that she's stupid, uh, and nope. lots of others come after you with a vitriol and a visceral, you can feel it. You can, when you're you watching. You should be there. Yeah, <laughs> right. Well, when I went to the GQ interview, yeah. Um, look, I've got to say, when I went to the Kathy Newman interview, Kathy Newman was very professional. We met in the green room beforehand. She was perfectly polite um, in, a, in a professional sort of way, you know, but that's fair enough. Professional politeness beats the hell out of, you know, random rudeness. So I'll take it. Um, when I walked into the GQ interview, and, and this was, I was already pretty worn out at that point, um, there was a photo shoot first, and than the interview, and that place was hostile right from the moment I walked in, and so I'm kind of on edge in that interview because I could feel that, and it was like um, the stage was set long before I walked into that, and so there wasn't even professional politeness. It was, you know, people can freeze up a room. Some people are really good at that. I think maybe it has to do with smell. You know, I lived with someone once, and you could tell if they were upset when you walked into the house, you'd get kind of an uneasy feeling. And <laughs> the only explanation I have for that is that it's related to smell at some unconscious level. In any case, the GQ interview atmosphere was unbelievably tense. And I was sort of in there for 45 minutes before I started talking. So I was, you know, I was already in the position of a cat who he hears dogs barking down the street. So um, in any case... It still isn't ob obvious to me what it is that causes such animosity. Well, let me posit a theory, Jordan, because this is what I really want to ask you. You tweeted the other day when Helen Lewis published her review of your book. You said, why do you hate me? I've tried to be a good man. And I replied saying, I think you've answered your own question. And my fear is, and my question to you is, 
Do you think that fundamentally, you mentioned toxic femininity, I don't like to get into this whole gender thing in that way because the whole gender war is a stupid thing to me as far as I'm concerned, but I do think it's possible that we live in a society where some people, those people that I'm talking about, they, they hate, they don't want strong men. They don't want men to be better. They want men to be weaker. And they see you as an agent of change who helps men to be better, and they are scared of that. Well, if you've had bad experiences with men, and, you know, that's probably the universal female experience, right? Because we all fall short of the ideal. Um, and, of course, that's deeply disappointing to women, just as women who fall short of the ideal are deeply disappointing to men. But let's say you've had less than ideal relationships, perhaps with any man in your life, um, it might make it very difficult for you to distinguish between authority and power, right? Because if authority is misused, it looks like power, and misused power is tyranny. And so the best thing to do in the case of misused power is to reduce the power. And if authority and competence never enter the issue, never enter the, the, the question, then you don't ever think you're sacrificing something, you're just dampening down the possibility of tyranny. This is partly why I, 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 the oppressive patriarchy narrative is so dis, distasteful to me. It's like, look, fair enough, you know, I mean, every hierarchical system has its tyrannical aspect. And you might say, well, let's get rid of hierarchies. And it's like, no, sorry, you can't even see without a hierarchy because you have to decide what you're going to look at. And you privilege what you're looking at over all the things you aren't looking at, and you produce a value hierarchy instantly. There's no escape from that unless you could equally attend to everything all the time, which you can't. So you're stuck with hierarchies. There's no escape from them. That doesn't mean they're universally benevolent, because they're not. And they get warped by power. But just because they get warped by power doesn't mean that that's their essence. Authority is their essence, and that's competence, right? And, but if you can't distinguish those two, well, then it's all out assault on anything that looks like power. Hmm. So, and there's definitely, there's, there's a huge element of that. It's so unfortunate because you see then that boys get punished for their ambition, you know, and because that looks like the route to power. I knew, I had friends who were so guilty about their ambition that, well, in one case, it, it killed him. He committed suicide. Now, he had his problems, you know, but one of them was that he was unbelievably guilty about being white, about being an oppressor, about, about any human activity, because he associated that with the despoiling of the planet. And it's not like we don't hear that story over and over and over.